Let's take a minute to talk about the difference between weather and climate. Weather is the instantaneous or short-term conditions that we happen to see outside, and climate is the average or aggregate conditions. And both of these things are usually defined relative to a normal or predefined, uh, usually arbitrary set of average conditions. And that predefined set of conditions usually changes depending on what we're talking about. So for example, if we say that the average temperature of the summertime is 80 degrees, then we can compare our weather conditions. If it happens to be 90 degrees, we know we're slightly warmer than average. Now let's look at some statements about weather and climate and see if we can tell the difference. For example, if I say it's 74 degrees out, is that a weather statement or a climate statement? Again, because I'm talking about an instantaneous technique or instantaneous conditions out there, that would be considered a weather condition. How about this time of year is usually in the 70s? Again, because we're talking about a, uh, an average condition, because we're looking at aggregate or average conditions, we're going to call that a climate uh, statement. How about Snow Basin received 12 inches of snow last night? That would be a weather statement. And lastly, it always rains in Utah on Halloween. That would be a climate statement because, again, we're talking about what usually occurs, uh, making some statement about the typical climate we might find. And we can represent different data uh, of weather and climate. Weather maps uh, tell us what's either happening outside right now or they give us some idea of what's going to happen in the near future. And they contain things like uh, temperatures and cloud cover conditions whether or not there's going to be any precipitation. Different types of precipitation are usually displayed with different symbols. And it also tells you something about what sort of pressures we expect, high pressures or low pressures. It tells us whether or not we have fronts, we have cold air on one side and warm air on the other. Or in this case, we've got a warm front. We have warm air on the side, cold air on the other side. This map lets us read off what sorts of conditions we might expect and even predict in the future. So these maps change moment to moment, day by day. Climate conditions can also be represented graphically. In this case, we have a map of the percent chance of sunshine. This is collected by looking at the, the number of clear days over, an, over a very large date range. But we see that we have the most chance of sun, sunny skies down here in southern uh, Arizona and the least chance of sunny skies up here in Upper Maine or, or in the Pacific Northwest. And so these are conditions that would be gathered from data over a long period of time. The other thing we can do with climate data is aggregate the weather data from different areas and display it so that we have some idea of what to expect. What you're looking at right here is called a climatograph, and it shows the temperature as a function of time for what we typically expect throughout a year. And this is for New York City. And so you can see that we have our average daily highs and our average daily lows, and they follow a trend through the year where it's warmer in the summertime and cooler in the wintertime. But then we also have our record daily lows and our record daily highs, which tells you the extreme conditions that you might have uh, from one summer to the next. So this is what you would expect for night and day temperatures, but you, there is some probability of having something this. And this is a way of, of, of outlining the, the general characteristics of the climate for a particular area by aggregating the weather data over a period of time. And again, you would want to know where, this data, where these data came from, uh, what period of time they were talking about, in order to assess the accuracy of the climatograph. It's a way to display these things so it's easy to interpret. I've downloaded a bunch of these uh, from Ogden, Utah. Uh, this is a uh, climatograph for the Ogden Sugar Factory. This is in the uh, Ogden Canyon. And you can see that we, again, have our record highs, record lows, and then our average highs and our average lows. If we compare that with something that's a little bit further out in the valley, we see there are some changes. It's not a huge change, but there are some changes. You can see that if we go further onto Pine View Dam, we see that we can get uh, slightly higher temperatures in the summertime at Pine View. And if we look at Huntsville, we get slightly lower temperatures in the summertime. And so while the changes are subtle, there are differences between the various climatographs for different areas. Now we'll be using some of these data as we go further on in the course, and you'll be using weather data from your own weather journal to make your own climatographs. So how do we gather all this information about weather? 
one of the things about weather is that it has to be measured and it has to be measured everywhere pretty much simultaneously in order to get an idea of what's happening. So how are we going to do this? The United States government deploys an enormous number of automated surface observing stations. You can see these all over the place. We have them all over the state of Utah. They're all over the country. Uh, you can go to the to the NOAA website and see where these stations are located and get weather data from those stations. Anytime you're looking at the the temperature data that you see on, say, a weather.com, it's coming from one of these stations. They have things like temperature sensors, humidity sensors, wind sensors, pressure sensors, all sorts of things uh, to gather information about what's going on. However, that's not quite good enough just measuring temperature at the ground. We have to get up into the atmosphere and see what is going on to get a full 3D picture of what's happening with the weather. And so one of the things that we do are fly aircraft uh, to take observations up to about 30 or 40,000 feet. We even have special, uh, specialized aircraft that fly into hurricanes. We also use weather balloons. Now these are, uh, in the case of the National Weather Service, they can be quite large uh, or they can be relatively small. Weather balloons that can do prolonged studies of the atmosphere tend to be big ones like this. Little weather balloons like this one are things that uh, the National Weather Service launches from about 50 stations twice a day. And in fact, a lot of people can get involved with this themselves. Uh, we have a group here at Weber State University that launches weather balloons to study the atmosphere. It's called the Harbor Group, and this is a group of our students who are preparing a weather balloon for launch. These balloons go up to about 100,000 feet, and they can take really cool pictures. If you send up a camera, this is a picture taken by our students at 98,000 feet from the Harbor Balloon. So it's a pretty cool experiment to be able to send stuff up that high into the atmosphere. Here's a web page for the National Weather Service. This tells us what our, we what our weather data is. I can put in a zip code, say for myself, and I can pull up the weather for my area here near Plain City. And I can see what the instantaneous conditions are. And this is something I'm sure that people visit uh, pretty frequently. However, there's an awful lot of data in here that we're going to be pouring over as we go forward. So this is, a, uh, this is where we get our weather data. Our climate data comes from a, uh, a government site called climate.gov. Uh, this is the website that aggregates all of the information that we're looking for to study the climate over time. So again, these are two different sides of the same, of the, of the same coin. You can get a uh, instantaneous snapshot of the weather, and those instantaneous snapshots are built up into how we study the climate as a whole.